Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. I am, uh, well, welcome to uh, this week's 3CO Travis Smith Lunchtime Seminar. And we've got a great turnout today, uh, which is a testament to the, uh, the appeal of our speakers. I'm delighted to introduce Lucy Reeve and Sarah Debney from Light Letters. Uh, we've actually got some proper lawyers this week instead of academics, which is always nice. Uh, and. Uh, just to tell you a bit about our speakers uh, before I hand the floor over to them. Uh, Lucy Reeve is a, a senior associate at the Light Latest Corporate Department. She has particular expertise in company law and the continuing obligations that apply to listed companies. Lucy coordinates Light Latest EU wide working group on the market abuse regulation and has been closely involved with monitoring its development and advising on its implications for listed companies. And uh, our other speaker, Sarah Devney, is a senior professional support lawyer in Link Latest Corporate Department who specialises in the continuing obligations of listed companies. Sarah has been monitoring the development and implementation of what we'll be talking about today, namely the market abuse regulation. As always, we'll have time for questions. I also think uh, there will be some activities involved in today's talk, which uh, I'm quite intrigued to know more about. So you will be called upon. Uh, you won't just get to sit and eat this week. <laughs> uh, and one thing to mention for those who are interested, because if I forget, if I wait till the end, there are also some uh, brochures as well. Uh, if uh, anyone's interested in finding out more about the firm, which uh, you can see at the end. So without further ado, I will hand over to Lucy and Sarah. Thanks, Mark. Hi everybody, thank you for coming and thank you for having us. So we... Um, wanted to come and talk to you today about the market abuse regulation because this has really taken over our world for the last 18 months or so. We spent a huge amount of time helping our clients, listed companies, FTSE 100, FTSE 250 companies, investors, directors and so on. We've spent a huge amount of time helping them prepare in advance for the new law that came into force last July. And then since then, dealing on almost a daily basis with queries from those clients as to how they apply these new rules to their day-to-day -day operations. Um, before we get into the detail of what this regulation means for listed companies, I just thought I'd start with a little bit of background to put it all into context for you. So in polite circles, market abuse is generally considered to be a bad thing because it undermines the stability of the financial markets and it harms public confidence in securities and derivatives. So way back in 2003, Europe introduced a market abuse directive and that was the previous source of all our rules in Europe on market abuse offences and various obligations on listed companies and other market participants that exist to underpin the integrity of the financial markets. Now, if everyone here can just take a moment and think back to 2003, where were you? What were you doing in 2003? If you think about it, it's actually quite a long time ago, and the world has changed since then. We have, the financial landscape has changed. We have new markets, new technologies, new ways of dealing. So the law needs to keep up with that change. We've also, in that intervening period, had a global financial crisis. And the financial crisis exposed some of the flaws and shortcomings in the previous framework of rules for market abuse. So the financial crisis was a <coughs> catalyst for review of the law in this area. And the outcome of that review was that we needed a stronger and more uniform framework for market abuse across the whole of the European Union. And the result of that is the market abuse regulation. It carries on the same broad themes that we always had before, it has a broader scope. It's much more prescriptive on procedural matters in a number of really important ways, which we're going to look at. And it also reflects market <coughs> developments. So, we used to have a directive, the Market Abuse Directive, and that's been replaced with the Market Abuse Regulation. So, can I have a show of hands, anyone who studied EU law? And those of you with your hands up, can one of you tell me the difference between a directive and a regulation? Very good. So a regulation has direct effect. 
So a directive, what we had before, we had the Market Boost Directive, but that was implemented separately in the national law of each jurisdiction. With a regulation, we don't have to do that. We have one rule book that has direct effects. So whether you are in Cyprus or Luxembourg, you've got the same rule book. And it's quite a thick rule book. I've got a copy here. We've got um, the level one text, which is the market abuse regulation. That's supplemented by a large number of technical standards and delegated acts, which are known as level two measures. And we also have some guidelines from the European Securities and Markets Authority on various particular matters. They're known as level three guidelines. In addition to that, we have some Q&A published by ESMA on um, sort of very specific queries that have come up. And at a local level, you might also have local uh, regulator guidance in each country. So it's the same rule book across Europe, but it is enforced separately in each country by the National Competent Authority. The Competent <coughs> Authority in the UK, does anyone know what that might be? Someone whispered it. The Financial Conduct Authority. Yeah. So the, the FCA enforces these rules in the UK. And actually the fact that it's enforced at a local level has already, even since July when it came <coughs> into force, we've already got discrepancies between how things are approached in the UK and how they're approached in Amsterdam, for example. So although it's designed to be uniform, um, discrepancies are appearing already. So one of the key changes in MAR was to apply the rules to a wider scope of markets. So in the past, the market abuse framework only applied to <coughs> securities which were listed on a regulated market, something like the London Stock Exchange. But actually, in the last 10 years, there's been a rapid increase in the use of other trading venues known as multilateral trading facilities. And these are sort of secondary markets. So things like AIM, the alternative investment market in London, is an MTF, a multilateral trading facility. So what MAR has done is it's expanded the um, reach of the rules to also cover these secondary markets. And that's had a huge impact on the companies who have their securities listed on those secondary markets. Because whereas um, issuers listed on the London Stock Exchange have gone from sort of one framework of rules to a, a new framework that has a lot of differences but is, you know, based on the same themes, issuers who are listed on those secondary markets have gone from nothing to having a whole load of rules and procedures they have to comply with. And that has turned people off to the extent that we have some clients who have moved or are looking to move their listing of debt in particular out of the EU. So um, we have an increase in issuers looking to list in the Channel Islands, for example, because that's not in the EU and therefore not subject to mark. Um, at that point, I should probably just deal with the elephant in the room, which is um, we are still a member of the EU at the moment and Brexit does not impact the application of MAR at this stage um, and we have no idea how it, how it will play out over the next couple of years, but we are still in the EU at the moment. So what we thought we'd focus on today is one key area of MAR that affects listed companies. MAR introduces rules on a whole host of areas, but we're going to focus in particular on the concept of inside information. Anyone who's seen the film Wall Street, um, or more recently seen the uh, TV show Billions with Damon Lewis, will be very familiar with the idea of insider trading or insider dealing. And, and that's what people tend to think about when they think about inside information. But actually, there's a lot more to it than that. And for a listed company, we've identified six key questions that they might have to consider regarding inside information. So what we're going to do now is take you through each of those questions and how um, we might deal with those. And Sarah's going to start us off. Right, so the first of these questions is, do we have it to begin with? And this is a really crucial question because it underlies everything, whether you have inside information or not. Um, it, it opens the doors to a lot of different offences, but it also um, lies at the base of lots of obligations and restrictions that companies end up having. 
So what happens in practice is that probably a, a number of managers within a company will identify that something has the potential to be inside information. And because this is a difficult question, and we'll look more at why it's so difficult in a minute, um, they escalated up to a body that most listed companies have called a disclosure committee. They didn't have one before, they are getting one very quickly now. Um, and that's made up of uh, more senior directors and others whose job it is to decide, do we actually have inside information or not? And if we do have it, what do we do about it now? And they will answer those questions in conjunction with us, their lawyers, and also, very importantly, their brokers. So why is it such a difficult question? Well, let's look at Article 7 of the regulation. Um, that contains the four limbs of what makes up inside information. So two of these limbs are straightforward, and two of them are less straightforward. And they're the ones that give us headaches. Can, can anyone pick out from uh, these four here, which are the ones that might give us more problems? It can just be a guess, obviously. Has not been made public. That's actually one of the easier ones. That's one of the because it either it is, it is either has been made public or it hasn't. There's no halfway house. Yeah. Yeah. Good. That's hard. Yeah. That, that's a difficult one. And the the other difficult one is that it's of a precise nature. And let's look. Um, let's look at why those are hard. So starting with precision to begin with, this is in Article 7.2 of the regulation, and it's a two-limb test. So that means both of these limbs here on the slide need to be satisfied in order for the information to, to fall, in, uh, fall into this category. So the first one uh, is that the information indicates circumstances that exist or may reasonably be expected to come into existence, or an event that has occurred or may reasonably be expected to occur. Now, again, we have a mixture of straightforward and not so straightforward here. So circumstances that exist or um, an event that's happened, great, they're either there or they're not there, that's fine. Um, the more difficult bits are may reasonably be expected to occur because how certain does that have to be in order to render the information precise or not for the purposes of this limb of the test? Um, here we look to case law to help us. So we have a European Court of Justice case called Daimler, and that uh, talked about um, a realistic uh, prospect of something happening that would be enough. That's a little bit of help, but what does, what's a realistic prospect as opposed to may reasonably be expected? Um, there we turn to the case of Hannum, which gave us a little bit more help and said, actually, what realistic prospect means is it just has to be more than fanciful. So actually, if you think about that, that's an incredibly low bar to, to fall or start falling into um, having inside information. I mean, if you think about a piece of information that perhaps you, know, you or I might think in the ordinary course of things is precise, that's not yet happened, just something more than fanciful. So it just has to be not completely ridiculous that this would happen in order to start satisfying the test of precision. And, and this is really the trend of things um, that regulators are pushing the limits of, of the wording in these tests to, to get as much as possible. And, and this is the way things are going and that's how, if you're on a disclosure committee and if you're, you're sitting at the end of the phone like we are, um, that's where your mind has to be because ultimately um, what's written down is one thing um, and it's how the regulator applies it then which is incredibly important. So the second limb of the test is that the information is specific enough to enable a conclusion to be drawn about the possible uh, effect of those circumstances or events on the price of securities. So the question here is, what kind of conclusion do you have to draw? Do you have to know, oh, well, the share price will go up by so much percent, or it will hit an exact figure, and that's definitely going to happen? What, what sort of place do you have to arrive at? Again, we look at uh, the case of Hannum for this, and, and that case said that you just have to know that the price will move in a, um, a known direction. So, oh, this will make the price go up, this will make it go down. You don't have to know how much it will go up and down. And also, you don't have to know with any particular certainty that it definitely will move, only that it might. 
And if it does, it will go in a known direction, which is, again, a very low bar. There was another case called um, La Fonta, and that will uh, that put the cat amongst the pigeons a bit because that said you don't have to know the direction at, that it will move in at all. You just have to know that it will move. So that takes a low bar and pushes it slightly lower. Um, and possibly for that reason, that case has kind of been almost deliberately forgotten um, by most people. Um, but it, it, it is there. Um, but the point is that it's a low bar and that when you go through this decision-making process, there are actually quite a lot of questions within questions to go through. So that's precise. And we have likely to have a significant effect on price. Um, so this we look to Article 7.4 of Ma, and this is information that uh, a reasonable investor would be likely to use as part of the basis for his or her decision making. Um, so there's no need to, con to, to separately consider what the effect on price would be. So again, we don't need to say, oh, a reasonable investor would use this and it's likely to, to move the price by a number of percentage points. Um, all you need to know is that a reasonable investor would use it. And the difficulty there is deciding what the investor would use and what they wouldn't use. Um, again, that could be a very wide um, uh, remit of things. If, if I was an investor, there's probably very little information that I wouldn't use, you know, unless it really was totally irrelevant. Um, again, there's some case law background here that I won't go into too much just in the interest of time, but, but there has been a, a conflict over recent years about is it just the reasonable investor test or is it the reasonable investor test plus some consideration of what the actual effect on price would be. And what Ma ended up enshrining in the legislation was that it's just the reasonable investor test. So hopefully that's given you a flavor of, of why the question of do we have inside information to begin with is so uh, tricky and why we spend so much time talking to our clients about it. Once they've decided that they do have inside well, that's when the, the, the universe opens and we have these different uh, constellations of things to think about. And the first one of these is, do we have to make an announcement? And <clears throat> before we answer that question, it's just worth taking a step back and, and thinking why we have these rules to begin with. What's the mischief that they're there to prevent? Um, and Recital 49 of Ma helps us out a bit with this. Um, because it states that the rules are there to, to avoid insider dealing and to ensure that investors aren't misled. So the whole essence of these rules is to ensure a level playing field in the market because as soon as you have this important information that some investors have and some don't, um, you've immediately got um, uh, economic inequality. So with that in mind... Of course, what's the, what's the solution to this problem? The solution is to give everyone the information as soon as possible. And that's exactly what the rules state. Um, that once you know that you have inside information, you've got to announce that to the public as soon as possible. And that's set down in Article 17 of Ma. And, and it can't be hidden away. Um, you don't want anyone to miss it. So the announcement has to, to state on its face that this announcement contains inside information. And that was a new feature of Mar. You didn't have to do that before. And that, and that is just one example of companies having to be a lot more precise in their thinking and more precise in the ordinary meaning of the word um, and more precise in definitely what they write down. So before they might have thought, well, yeah, maybe it's inside information, maybe it's not. You can't do that now. You have, you have to make a, a, a strict decision. There are some exceptions to this rule, but it's not uh, uh, an exception that allows you to avoid disclosure, it's just an exception that allows you to delay for a while. And ESMA um, set out some guidelines about uh, where you will be able to delay, and, uh, and these are set out on the slide. So the disclosure, if it's likely to prejudice the company's legitimate interests, and I'll come back to, to what those mean in a minute, um, and then also that delaying disclosure is not likely to mislead the public, and also that the issuer can ensure the confidentiality of the information. 
So in terms of a company's legitimate interests, what are they? Well, ESMA set, sets out a few of these, and by far the most commonly used one is that a company is in the middle of ongoing negotiations. Um, that, that's the one that, that we see uh, time and again. So if a company is involved in an acquisition, for example, um, and in the middle of negotiating terms, that's the one that will apply. There are others too, um, <clears throat> because we have an insolvency expert in the front row. There's one if an institution's um, or a company's uh, financial situation is in grave and imminent danger, then you can delay there. Um, and there's another one at the bottom of the slide that I'll mention now, that if you're a financial institution, like a bank, for example, you can also delay where your disclosure risks um, the stability of the financial system. So essentially, if you're a bank in trouble and you want to avoid a run on the bank, Northern Rock style, um, this is the one that you would use there. Note that you have to have prior FCA consent for that one. However, if you're a failing bank, the FCA is already going to be in a lot of discussions with you anyway. Um, so delaying disclosure, not likely to mislead the public. What's likely to mislead the public? Um, ESMA has produced guidelines on that too. And in a nutshell, these uh, state that if the market expectation is directly opposed to the information that you have, delaying the disclosure of that is likely to mislead the public because they're already operating, possibly because of announcement that you've made before um, or some other signals that you've put out that things are going to be very different from how they actually are. So now we move on to, can we share it? Okay, so let's assume that you've identified that something is inside information and you've identified that you are able to delay disclosure of that information to the market. So the next question might be, well, can we share <coughs> that inside information in that period between us identifying it and ultimately announcing it to the market? So one of the conditions for continued delay and disclosure is that the issuer has to be able to preserve the confidentiality of that information. But as well as considering that, because if, if there's a leak, if confidentiality is breached, then that triggers um, an immediate obligation to announce at that point, which you might not want to do. You also have to consider a market abuse offence of unlawful disclosure of inside information. And this is broadly where an insider, who is someone who has access to inside information by virtue of their job or their shareholding, or otherwise has inside uh, information in circumstances where they ought to have known that it was inside information. So an insider, if they disclose that inside information to somebody else, that is an offence unless that disclosure is within the proper course of the performance of their um, employment, profession, or duties. Okay, so it's a civil offence in Ma. There is separately a criminal offence um, for this. I wouldn't say the prisons are overflowing with people um, committed of un unlawful disclosure, but it is something you can face up to seven years in prison for, and something where there have been a high number of high-profile enforcement actions in the last few years. So it is something that people are very focused on and very concerned about. Now, the fact that you have to preserve confidentiality of information um, while you're delaying disclosure, and the fact that there is an offence of unlawful disclosure of inside information, does not mean that a company cannot tell anybody about the information at all before it announces it formally then there are circumstances in which it's legitimate to share that information, for example, to obtain legal advice or to negotiate a transaction. So what issuers have to do is put in place procedures so that the sharing of the information will fall within that test normal exercise of employment professional duties. So you put a framework in place so that if you are sharing inside information, it will be considered legitimate. And in practice, you do that by making sure you only share the inside information to the extent necessary to the people you strictly need to share it with in order to achieve a legitimate end, like negotiating a transaction. And you have to make sure that the person you're sharing the information with undertakes to keep it confidential. So that's how we get around all of that in practice. Now, one of the new features introduced by <coughs> Mar that wasn't in the old directive is a framework for market soundings. Does anyone know what a market sounding or a pre-sounding is? 
So market soundings are used often in the financial markets. They're really a crucial part of the proper functioning of the markets. If you are about to do a transaction where you will be looking to investors to put in some more money into the company, you don't just announce it. You sound out a few key people before you announce it to everybody. And so I might call you up and say, would you be interested in subscribing for some shares at this price, this volume, in this situation? And then you might say yes or no, but I would if it was a lower price. And, and we have that conversation, and that helps me to understand where I should pitch that offer. So these market soundings are really important. But what I've just told you might be inside information. The fact that we're looking to do that might be inside information. So it puts a risk on, on the issuer or, or more likely the bank or financial advisor who's, who's taking part in that conversation. They, there's a risk there that they are committing unlawful disclosure of inside information. So Mar introduced this whole framework of procedures and measures that if you follow all these very strict procedures, you automatically are not committing an offence. So it's not unlawful disclosure of inside information if you follow detailed procedures for a market sounding and you follow them to the letter, then you get a get-out-of-jail-free card effectively. This is something we could do a whole other hour on, so I'm not going to go through it other than to say um, it's new, it's relevant to the way financial markets operate, and it's something that um, banks and institutions are um, slowly getting to grips with. So having decided whether you can share the inside information um, you're delaying disclosure of, the next question might be, can we deal? Can the company deal? And can our staff, our people deal? So you've all heard of insider dealing, but why do we have rules against insider dealing? It, it's fundamental to fair and in, um, financial markets that have integrity that you have a level playing field between different investors. So if you go and buy some shares on the basis of a secret you know about the company, then you have an advantage over you over there who doesn't have that information. And that's not fair. And the markets wouldn't operate properly if you were allowed to do that. So that's why insider dealing is banned. Again, it's a civil offence and a criminal offence. And you can go to prison for up to seven years um, if you do it. So I'd advise that you don't. Um, so... It's unlawful for an insider, so again, that's someone who has access to inside information by virtue of their role, um, to deal in securities or to recommend or induce someone else to deal. So you can't get around it by you know, telling your mum to deal for you. And there is a presumption that if you have inside information, you have used it. So if you are in possession of inside information and you deal, there is a presumption that you have committed an offence, and you're then on the back foot, and you would have to prove that you didn't use that inside information. And this is something that comes up all the time, because there might be something that you were going to do anyway, and you actually are not influenced by the information you have, but because you have it, you shouldn't be dealing at that time. So something like um, employees exercising share options... You, know, you don't want them to do that whilst they're in possession of inside information, even though it might be something they were going to do anyway, unless you can show to the FCA, if they came and asked about it, unless you can show them, actually, we made the decision to deal before we had the inside information. So we get lots of questions around this. Um, there are a few legitimate behaviours. So these are um, situations where it isn't insider dealing and they include things like where there's an information barrier between two parts of an institution so if one part receives the information and the other part holds some shares and sells them then as long as there is a barrier an information barrier between those two parts that's not insider dealing and again that's something that in the banks they rely on all the time um, because they wouldn't be able to operate otherwise so that's insider dealing um, in a nutshell. The other question for listed companies is what procedures they have to have in place. Okay. 
So this question really surrounds what companies have to do day to day in order not to fall foul of all of this theory. So one area in particular is something I was just talking about, which is delaying disclosure of your inside information. So, and this is a, a change, something that was new with the regulation. If you delay your disclosure of inside information, once you then go ahead and announce it, you have to notify the FCA of the fact that you delayed your disclosure. And that notification has to contain some very specific information. So the date and time when the inside in information first arose, also the date and time that you took the decision to delay, and also who were the people responsible for uh, uh, taking the decision to delay. So uh, essentially you're, you're giving the FCA upfront all this information um, if they want to question you and question your decision making. Um, before, there, there was always the ability to delay disclosure, but you never used to have to make this announcement. So actually you could be a lot more um, imprecise in your thinking. And as I said before, maybe we have inf inside information, maybe we don't, but actually we're in the middle of negotiations anyway, so we can delay. Let's, you know, let's uh, not worry too much about it. Um, now that's, that's gone, that possibility. You absolutely have to know you have inside information and you have to know the, the date and also the very time that it arose. So that, that means that you've got to have, when you actually think very practically about it, you've got to have the procedures in place to enable the disclosure committee to, to draft and release all this. So you have to make sure that you have the adequate written records, you have to know who is in the room. Um, so that means that the knock-on effect is, is that the minutes, one knock-on effect, the minutes of these disclosure committee meetings are now much more detailed than they were previously. The FCA also has the option, doesn't have to, but it has the option to demand from a company an explanation of how the conditions for uh, delay were satisfied. And those were the three things I mentioned on the previous slide, so that it was there to protect uh, the company's legitimate interest, the public weren't misled, and also the issuer could uh, ensure the confidentiality of the information. But the fact that the FCA have an option to ask for this, and you're the company, you have to be prepared every time for the FCA to ask for it because you can't be caught by surprise. You have to produce this very quickly if you're asked for it. So again, you have to have the procedures in place to make sure all of that is written down and you've got this very accurate paper trail to produce this when you need it. And this is um, for, for companies, this, is kind of, this affects bread and butter everyday life. Insider lists is another area where there's a lot of procedure bound up with the rules. So insider lists are um, records lists kept by uh, companies and those acting on their behalf who are working for them with access to inside information. Um, insider lists, they're not a new thing under the regulation. They were there before, but now actually they require more detailed information than before, and, and they need to be very promptly updated Obviously, someone's added, someone's taken away, or there's a change in the reason why someone has access to inf inside information. All that has to be um, uh, updated very quickly. And also, and this is something that causes headaches for companies, if you're all on an insider list, you need to provide an acknowledgement in writing of your legal and regulatory duties. Um, and, and again, the, the rules are kind of one thing, and, and actually it's fairly straightforward. Um, actually implementing this day to day is much more difficult and keeping track of all this information. For example, one of the things, um, one detail that's asked for um, is a maiden name. Well, if I go and work for a new firm tomorrow, I'm not going to know my maiden name. So how do they find that information out from me? There wasn't a procedure to do that before, no one thought to ask, but now they have to ask. So that's just a very small example of something where someone's job now has to change to make sure I'm asked that question. And, uh, and, and you won't be surprised to, to hear that an industry is, is uh, developed in order to meet this new need. So there are lots of service um, software providers who are providing software that takes care of insider lists and 
kind of shoots out automatic um, acknowledgements that can be shot back in again um, because companies were genuinely wondering how they were going to manage this. So if one of these procedures goes awry and actually you end up falling foul of these rules, what can be done to you? So the FCA has quite a number of things in its arsenal to, to punish anyone who falls foul of it. So uh, the FCA can issue an unlimited fine, note unlimited, so it could be enormous, um, or public censure, and I'll come back to that one. Um, the FCA can also suspend or limit permission to carry out a regulated activity, that's at the business of banks, for example. Um, so if you are a bank and you, you get your <laughs> permission to carry out your activity taken away, that's going to be obviously incredibly damaging. The FCA can also require you, if you're a company and you've put out something that was misleading, they can make you put out more information or a corrective statement, um, which is obviously um, hugely embarrassing, um, at, at the very least. Um, the FCA can also suspend trading of your securities. Now, public censure. This is something that I think often kind of gets gloss over at the end of the list, like, oh yeah, you can also just be told off. Um, which doesn't, in the face of an unlimited fine, that doesn't sound so bad. But actually, I would say for our clients, um, this is actually what they're more worried about. They're more worried about being publicly told off and the reputational damage that that does you um, than actually <coughs> a fine. Um, so this is just a, a quick note to say, this is incredibly important. Um, don't gloss over it because this is something that in practical terms is feared greatly. So that's quite a lot of information to take in. So we thought we'd test you and check that you um, had taken it all in. Can you just to the next slide? Yeah. So we've got some scenarios here and I just want to see what you think about these. So let's take the first one. Um, Keys is considering buying another college and it's identified two possible targets and made an initial approach. If Keys was a listed company, do you think it has inside information? Hands up if you think it has inside information. Hands up if you think it doesn't have inside information. Okay, so lots of people didn't put any hands up. Um, okay, so who can tell me how you would go about considering whether it has inside information. What are the four things you have to consider? Come on, this was my slide. Come on. <laughs> what, what, what four questions do you have to ask? It's not a trick question. You've got the answer in front of you there. Okay. Must have the college. Um, well, if we're looking at whether the co if, if the, we're saying the college was a listed company, if it was a listed company, would it have inside information? So you've got the four limb test, and you have to ask the questions uh, and answer those questions in, in that four limb test. So is the information public? Has the information been made public? Yes or no? No. So it meets that test. Does it relate to a listed company or its securities? Yes? Okay. Is it precise? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult so one, isn't it? The, it's is hard. It, so whether something's precise, is it a high bar or a low bar? Good. There we go. So this is, now I've been very mean to you here, this is a scenario that we used in one of our internal training sessions and there were almost fisticuffs over it. Yeah, um, exactly. No, people we can't even agree, agree whether it was precise or not. But, but that's the kind of situation we are dealing with day in, day out, where clients say, in the past, <coughs> you, you wouldn't have had to consider exactly when you had inside information because in this kind of situation, you didn't have to announce straight away anyway. But now, as Sarah said, you have to pinpoint exactly the time and date when you had inside information. You have to consider these sorts of scenarios and make a decision, have we got inside information now or not? So I'll give you a slightly easier one. So um, the CEO or, or master... Hold on, hold on, hold on, what's the answer? Ah, well, 
What do you think well, the I, is? I think the answer is you do. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the answer is you do have inside information, yeah, but you can delay. We are, um, as women, you know, conservative, so we think we do have inside information here. But there were others within our firm who were strongly saying, you know, actually, no, that's too low a test. So it's just an example of how difficult these questions are to address in practice. It depends on what the initial approach is and what's been said. Yeah, yeah. You'd probably mm. need more information about the context and, um, you know, I've glossed over the public, the fact that it hasn't been made public, but if it had been made public that um, the company's strategy included making an acquisition in the, in the coming year, then that would influence your decision as well. So you always have to consider the much wider context of these things. Okay, I'll give you another one. Um, the CEO or master of Girton, PLC, has indicated uh, to some of her fellow directors that she would like to retire before the next annual general meeting. Does anyone think this is inside information? Hands up if you think that's inside information. Okay, hands up if you think it's not inside information. Okay, so those of you who said it's not inside information, which of the four limb tests do you think it fails? It's more precise. Yep, everyone agree with that? So there was a um, European court decision a few years ago uh, where the chairman of um, a car company, Daimler, had told some of his friends who were on the board that he, he was probably going to resign. And it wasn't announced until much later. When it was announced, uh, because he was such a terrible chairman, the share price went up, and some shareholders who had sold their shares in the intervening period brought a claim because they effectively lost money. Uh, and the court found that, that actually it was precise at a much earlier stage. If you have a protracted process, and there are a number of steps in the process, Something can be precise, even if it's just um, one of the steps in a, in a much more involved process. So in that case, it was inside information um, at quite an early stage. Even though everyone, you know, we had a lot of sympathy for the lawyers who'd said, oh, no, that's not precise. You know, you don't have to announce it yet. That's the way it, it, it's sort of moving. Does anyone have any questions at this point before we do the last couple of scenarios? So next one, um, Selwyn College PLC is preparing its financial results. Early indications are that its results are in line with market expectation. So this is something that comes up twice a year for every company. They prepare their results, their financial results, and there's a period between the year end and when they actually make the announcement, and they will have a, a scheduled date when they are going to release their results to the market. So the question that we've had to consider a lot under MAR is whether at any time between the year end and the date you're planning to release your results, whether you might have inside information before you actually release them. So is there a point during which you're preparing your financial results where you've got a picture of what they're going to be and therefore it's precise. So have you got inside information? And if you have got inside information, on what basis can you delay disclosure until the date that you want to announce? So this again is something where there have been some strong and passionate views and not everyone in the city agrees on what the answer to this is. Um, we have taken the view that if your results are in line with market expectation, then you don't have inside information because a reasonable investor would not use that information as a basis of their investment decisions. Um, that is not a foolproof analysis, but we think that is better than the alternative, which is that you have inside information as soon as you know broadly what the results are going to look like, and then you're sort of trying to find a way fudge to a delay. Do, yeah, fudge an ability to delay disclosure until the date that you've told investors the information will be released. So again, that's just an example of 
you know, we've gone through all the theory and what the rules are, but when you actually apply it to the situations companies are facing um, regularly, it becomes incredibly tricky, which is why all companies need uh, very expensive lawyers. <laughs> um, Sorry. Oh. Can we have one more? There we go. Okay, so slightly different question here. So um, PEAS is, is um, carrying on its acquisition trail and it decides actually we're going to buy Peter House. And PEAS determines that it has inside information, so it records the date and time and so on. But it decides it can delay announcement until the terms are agreed. So obviously if you made an announcement before the terms of the transaction are agreed, then that, that skews the bargaining power of the parties because you've already told everybody that you're going to do the deal. Um, so they've decided they can delay announcement. Then they decide actually we can't afford this, we need to raise some money from our shareholders. So we're going to go and do an equity raising. So we're going to issue some shares, new shares to investors in return for some money. And we want to go and chat to some investors to see if they would be interested in giving us some money to help us fund this transaction. So first question, is Keys allowed to tell investors, shareholders, about the proposed acquisition of Peter House? So we've already said that this is inside information. So hands up if you think uh, that Keys is allowed to share this information with investors. Okay, that's right, it can. But what procedures does it have to put in place to do so? What, what, what does this conversation sound like? What Heard some of you whisper what, it, that was what right. What type of conversation is this? Sounding. Yeah, it's a market sounding. Okay, so very detailed procedures have to be followed. That includes reading a script. You have to contact the investors, make sure you're speaking to the person at the investor who's authorised to receive market sounding. You have to say, do you agree to receiving inside information? And they might say, about what? And then you say, I can't tell you until you agree to receive it. Um, and then you have to say, by receiving this inside information, you confirm that you will not be entitled to deal in affected securities and that you must not share this information, um, both of which until you are cleansed. Does anyone know what cleansing means? So cleansing is when um, you don't have inside information anymore. So if you're given inside information as an investor, at what point do you think that investor wouldn't have inside information anymore? I'm not going to have inside information forever, so someone, you're all very shy. Yeah, exactly. So either the transaction you've been, you've been speaking about has been announced, therefore it's not inside information because it's public, or, and what's trickier is when somebody plans to do something and then for whatever reason it doesn't happen anymore, they change their mind, so it falls away at some point there, you don't have inside information anymore either. So it's only when one of those two things happen that the investor is cleansed and, and thereafter free to deal in the securities again. And there are a, a load of other procedures like record keeping, you, if you have a conversation on a phone line, it's got to be recorded, and all sorts of things like that. Um, so that's market soundings in a nutshell. <coughs> that was everything we were going to talk to you about, but did anyone have any questions or comments?